What's up, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, UFC Fight Night, Nama Yunez versus Cortez is this weekend in Denver, right? So like 35 minutes away from me. I live just south of Denver. Uh, I th- I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but like I train at Easton, uh, particularly Easton Centennial. Uh, so yeah, I'm like 35 minutes from downtown Denver, but I'm doing Total Archery Challenge this weekend. It's the same weekend, so I registered for that, so I'll be driving out west to shoot that while the fights are going on. But I'm hoping to catch them on Saturday night when I get back. We'll see. I don't think I'm going to have time. I think I'm going to have to rewatch them. But anyway, uh, big fight card coming up this weekend. Uh, Big fight in the headliner between Rose Namajunas. Originally supposed to be Macy Barber, right? But she pulled out and is replaced with Tracy Cortez. Uh, Before we get into the card, though, I want to talk about some news. Uh, I definitely want to talk about the Diaz versus Masvidal boxing match. So let's just start there. Personally, I thought it was one of the more entertaining boxing matches that I've watched in a while, right? It was competitive, and it's competitive because both of these guys have been in MMA their entire career, right? And I will say, Nate Diaz looked much more motivated in this fight against Masvidal than he did in his fight against Jake Paul, right? But when you look at Jake, Jake is a young guy, probably realistically taking some sort of supplements. Who fucking knows, right? Like, he's probably, like on something, like I suspect a lot of people are. Anyway, irregardless, right? Jake is a big guy, he's young, and he's been training specifically for boxing, and you know, it's, don't get me wrong, Diaz and Masvidal obviously have the edge in terms of experience, but they are getting older, and they fought MMA their entire career, so the stylistic approach is a little bit different, whereas Jake doesn't really have a background, so he's, you're able to mold him a little bit more. And he's basically, I mean, I know he wrestled and stuff, but primarily he's been training in boxing for particular boxing matches, right? Like, he's, he's boxing constantly, and I know that he hasn't been fighting the highest level of talent, but it doesn't change the fact that he's boxing all the time. Whereas these guys that he's fighting are trying to transition to boxing way later in their career after fighting in MMA, which requires a way different style, right? So when Diaz and Masvidal clash, you get this really interesting and fun matchup. Like, in my opinion, I don't care if it was the most technical boxing match you've ever seen, but it was fun, and they threw a lot of fucking punches. And I thought that, personally, Masvidal won, in my opinion, right? It's not, And I, I thought that Masvidal maybe snuck it out by a round, or it was a draw. It was super close. But don't get me wrong, I can see how if you favor... And I'm not the person to be scoring boxing matches at all. I don't watch enough of it. I don't understand the criteria enough. Just based on my opinion, though, I felt like Masvidal was hurting him more often. And I can absolutely understand, though, if you give the fight to Diaz because of that smothering approach, right? Like that just constant volume and his ability to weather that storm and eat a lot of those big shots that Masvidal landed and just keep coming forward and like being the one showboating a little bit more, right? Like, and Diaz landed some shots that definitely like snapped the head of Masvidal back. But I just felt like the cleaner, more effective strikes were landed by Jorge, right? Personally. But I had no problem with the decision. I mean, I thought one of the scorecards was outrageous and the amount of rounds they gave Nate, but I don't know, man. It was a close fight and it was entertaining. And what more can you want? And to think that these guys are the ones who kicked off the whole BMF title, which leads to Max's knockout over Gaethje and Gaethje's knockout over Poirier before that, right? Like, these are the guys who, like, gave birth to that and gave us some of these great moments in UFC history. You know what I mean? Like, moments that are going to go down and be cemented into the fucking legacy of these guys, right? Like, it's crazy. And to see them come back together and be 39 years old and still fight at what was for, like I said, all these things considered, their age, like, it was just a great matchup. It ended up being a good, entertaining fight between two guys who could still be competitive in the UFC, right? I'm not saying they're going to go win a title, but they could win fights in the UFC. Look at what Jim Miller does, Bobby Green, guys that are like, don't get it twisted. Like, I think Nate and Jorge beat a lot of guys in the UFC right now that aren't making their way up through that ranking, right? Like those guys that are in that top 10, maybe those are hard matchups, right? But top 15, there's guys on the roster that they're going to beat. So it was cool to see them come together and clash. And I thought, what, what more do you want, man? It was a good fight. Speaking of Nate Diaz, Michael Chandler is now calling for a fight against Nate Diaz at Noche UFC, right? At the Sphere. And if you think about it, it makes sense. And if I'm Michael Chandler, I can see I can see how I'd want to be active instead of sitting around waiting on Connor. And if you think you can beat Nate, wouldn't you want to set that fight up and like 
get a win under your belt and have some momentum going into the Connor fight, which A, might not ever happen. You might sit around waiting for him forever and the fight never materializes. He just decides to never fight again, right? But in the chance that you do fight him, wouldn't you rather be the guy with some momentum and a fight under your belt going into that Connor fight, knowing that he's had the layoff that he's had? When he, don't you think that'd give you a leg up? That's what I'd be thinking if I was Chandler. And the call out itself makes sense because it's a, it's a fight people would want to see. Like the fight does kind of make sense, right? Like if Nate Diaz were to make a comeback, Connor can't fight right now. Michael Chandler's an exciting fight to fucking do it, to, to set up. I think it's a good fight. I think it's actually a smart call out by Chandler. It keeps him active. And I think it has potential to be competitive because Chandler's a good wrestler. It's like Chandler's wrestling Nate's jujitsu, right? And then it's like fucking uh, Chandler's power versus Nate's chin. Like there's a lot of things on paper that in my opinion, you can get excited about in that fight. So I think it's a great call out by, uh, by Chandler. And I'd be interested to see if Diaz shows any interest in that and if the UFC does. I think it's a good fight. And it's a good addition to that fucking card, too. Uh, speaking of matchups, Buna Saint Denis and Hanada Moicano just got booked for France, and that's a big fight. Saint Denis going to look to rebound after his loss to Poirier. And Moicano just beat Dober, I believe, right? That was his last fight. So, uh, big fight for both of these guys. And, you know, this is a chance for Moicano to kind of cat. He's 35 now. It's a chance for him to kind of catapult himself up. Oh, Jalen Turner, he just beat too right, before, right after Drew Dober. He's on a three-fight win streak, right? He, lo he lost to RDA in 2022. Then he beat Brad Riddell, Drew Dober, and Jalen Turner. And he finished Brad Riddell and Jalen Turner. So he's been looking good of late. And like I said, St. Denis is going to be looking to rebound. So that's a big fight. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I got. I mean, I'm sure I'm missing stuff, right? As per usual, it's been a while since I put one of these out. So we'll go ahead and move on to the matchups on the main card now, or what I think is the main card. On the UFC's website right now, it's literally, oh no, the main card is listed. Earlier it was just listed as the fight card, right? So first fight we're going to look at is Abdul Razak Alhassan versus Cody Brundage. It's going to be a middleweight bout, and you got Abdul Ra uh, Abdul Razak Al Hassan coming in as a slight favorite over Brundage, right? And this fight, like we said, is going on in Denver. Brundage is a Factory X guy. Oh, also, we're, I, I want to make sure we cover this. Josh Fremd was uh, on the podcast back in like November, October, last fall. Uh, so if you guys go, go to the uh, back in my channel, off the, I forget which episode, but maybe I'll put like a little card up here or something so you can just click it. I did an interview with him. He was super cool. He's from the Pittsburgh area, right? I'm from like an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh, so it was cool to sit down and talk to him, get his perspective on things. He's fighting Andre Petrosky, right? So a big fight uh, for Josh Frum this weekend. I'm wishing him luck, man. But uh, yeah, moving on to his teammate, Cody Brundage versus Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Good matchup, and man, Brundage, for being a wrestler, right? Like, you know he's got a wrestling pedigree. Uh, obviously, not on that level that Bo Nickel is. We found that out in their fight. But still really talented in that department and willing to take some fucking chances. I mean, Cody Brundage is a guy who throws a lot of big, like, spinning stuff. He'll leap across the cage, throw flying knees. I mean, he gets a little bit reckless in there. He has that slam knockout, right, when he was – I forget the guy's name uh, – but he has that slam knockout when the, the guy was trying to, like, triangle him. So he has different ways to finish you, right? And he's a pretty exciting fighter to watch. Like, he's going to get after it. And he's going up against a guy in Al Hassan who has big power, right? I mean, Al Hassan's legs are like fucking tree trunks. But uh, Al Hassan has big power. You got to watch out for that. And he's a very good striker, right? But... Man, I just feel, and we've seen Al Hassan mix in the wrestling and stuff. We've seen him take that approach, but I would imagine that Brundage is going to have an advantage there. I kind of think, like I know, like I said, Brundage is a slight dog, but I just feel like if I'm looking, I feel like he has more ways to get it done. Al Hassan is probably a little bit cleaner on the feet. He's probably a little bit more like well-rounded in that department. He probably has a higher chance of just. In a, like maybe like a kickboxing match, knocking Brundage out. But the threat of the wrestling is always going to be present for Brundage. And I kind of like Brundage's ability to create these crazy moments. Again, there's a detriment to that. 
being explosive like that and doing these wild, unpredictable things also oftentimes leaves you open defensively. And Al Hassan, like we mentioned, he has that big power. He's not the kind of guy that you want to do that against. He's not the kind of guy that you want to be backing up against the cage either, right? Like if Al Hassan starts controlling the footwork, I think he can back Brundage up and put him in trouble. But overall, I think if Brundage is able to mix things together well in this fight, I think he can get the win. I just feel like personally he has more options. The question is, like I said, how does he layer all of it together and mix it all in? If you're seeing smooth transitions between the hands and the takedowns and he's like taking these calculated risks when he throws these big that wild shit, then fine, right? But if he starts getting a little bit too reckless, that can start to wear on you. And Al Hassan, like I said, is not a guy that you want to make mistakes against. So it just depends on, like I said... How well, and it's mixed martial arts, how well does Brundage mix it all up? But I like Brundage this weekend. I think he's going to win. Uh, let's see. Julian Arosa versus Christian Rodriguez. Julian Arosa plus 180 dog. I, again, I feel like we got a live dog in Julian Arosa. The thing with Christian Rodriguez, and he's been super impressive, but his fights have primarily come against young prospects, right? Like Raul Rosas Jr., right? We kind of saw Rodriguez... I wouldn't say put a stop to the hype train. I feel like there's still a lot to be excited about with Rosas. But we saw him overcome this kind of, like, swarm. Like, you know, I mean, fucking Rosas came out hot. And you saw Christian Rodriguez survive that, get through it, and end up picking up the victory, right? And kind of putting Rosas in this position where he realizes he has to control his energy a little bit better. Rodriguez did a better job of that and won. Um... I kind of thought he lost his most recent fight against Dalgarian, just personally. And before that, he beat Cameron Simon. But do you see, like, the names on this list are a lot of young prospects. And to pick up wins over them is a big deal because you're rising to the top of those, like, you're rising over top of them, right? But, man, Jolian Arosa is a guy who is a veteran. I do think that in terms of just like the boxing department and stuff, arosa has got an unorthodox style, but he can still hurt you. I think Rodriguez has a depart- an advantage in the boxing department. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens when this fight goes to the ground because Arosa has some good jujitsu, And like I said, 13 submissions to his name, 11 knockouts. Like Arosa is a finisher. Granted, he's been knocked out seven times, right? He's been finished a lot too. But... I just feel like you can underestimate a Rosa, and if you do that, if you're Rodriguez, he can put you in some tough positions, right? Like, he remember how he beat up on Hakeem Dawadu? I mean, man, that was impressive. He went out and really, he put it on Dawadu. And Rodriguez, like I said, hasn't been tested like that. I just feel like he's got so many fights on his record, and I know he's a little bit older, but I really feel like, and also another thing, is Julian Rosa is a relatively big guy for a hundred and what are they fighting at? 45 pounds for featherweight. Rodriguez is 5'7 and Arosa is 6'1. He's a big dude. He can reach out and touch you. And if Rodriguez isn't able to find him, Arosa might be able to start making things difficult early and never letting that momentum get going. And then the veterans tend to take on The later rounds anyway, that's where they tend to shine because, like I said, things of like there's things with energy expenditure. The guy wears himself out too much and they don't expect him to still be there and he is and all these different things, right? But Arosa, because of his reach and everything and just his angles that he attacks from, he might be able to go out there and start tagging Rodriguez up early. I don't know. I feel like Rodriguez is really talented. I'm just interested to see how he does against a guy like he might knock Arosa clean out in the boxing. You can freeze a Rosa up. A Rosa has been finished plenty of times. But out of his 11 wins, Rodriguez has only knocked out three guys. And that's not a terrible knockout, right? I mean, he's got four submissions to his name as well. But I think that a Rosa is going to be a hard guy to finish. I do think that Rodriguez might have an advantage a little bit in the pure wrestling department, right? He's probably the one more likely to get the fight to the ground. But I think a Rosa is going to be able to stay alive down there. I think he's crafty. He'll get back to his feet, and he can make this a difficult fight for Rodriguez. So I think Arosa's is a live dog. Next, we got a welterweight bout. Gabriel Bonfim versus Angelusa. I'm sure I'm pronouncing the name wrong. I always fuck his name. No matter how many times I hear it, I feel like I always fuck it up. Angelusa. I think it's Ange. We'll go with Ange. All right, so Bonfim versus Angelusa. Bonfim 
we're talking a lot. The, the Arosa versus Rodriguez fight, right? Is the reason also that I feel like I'm giving it merit and giving Arosa a lot of credit and props, like thinking he can win that fight, is because of Nicholas Dalby versus Gabriel Bonfim. Like that's what's sticking in my head when I was doing research for, this, for these fights. Bonfim is, in terms of talent and skill and ability, is probably in a just being honest, like a different stratosphere than Nicholas Dalby. But in a fight, that's not the only thing that matters. And that's why Dalby was able to pick up the win. When you're Bonfim and you've run through absolutely everybody and you finished all 15 of your wins, you feel invincible. And when you put it on a guy like Dalby for the first round, but then he's still there in the second and he's still fighting, it can be discouraging. And Bonfim, throughout the whole fight even, I thought that he fought hard, but he just expended too much energy too soon. I think that's going to be, it, it should be at least, the biggest takeaway from him in that fight. He's more talented than Dalby. He's more skilled. And if he would have just slowed things down a little bit more when he realized that Dalby was surviving what he was throwing at him, he probably wins that fight. He's, in my opinion, he's a more skillful fighter. But like I said... Skill is not the only thing that matters in fighting, right? And energy expenditure, I guess you could argue, is part of the skill set, like being able to do that. So maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe it is the only thing when it boils down to it. But you guys get what I mean, right? Now, Andre is somebody who has been mixing in the wrestling a little bit more recently. He's been looking good, but I worry that he's starting to get good at that and he's good at mixing things up. He definitely has power in his hands. He throws good combos. He mixes the leg kicks in well. He's a good, well-rounded fighter. He's a problem, and it's not that he doesn't have a chance in this fight, but again, I'm just looking at the talent and the skill and what Bomb Theme just most recently went through. You got to think he's going to learn from that. And as long as he doesn't get into this trap that some people fall into where they get a little too hesitant in their next fight, I think that he's just more skillful than Lusa. I think that he's going to go out there and be able to dominate in those grappling exchanges. And I just don't see, other than being, the fight has to stay on the feet, in my opinion, for Lusa to win. Like I said, I know we've seen him take guys down. I know we've seen him mix in the wrestling. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying when you look at the talent, Bonfim's the guy who's probably going to start, who's going to dominate those exchanges, right? So, there's something about the way that Bonfim passes guard, the way he advances position, his understanding of where he needs to be on the ground. Like when he's on, he's on another level. There's a reason he has so many fucking submissions to his name. And I think that he's going to do the same thing to Lusa. I think Lusa's going to be feeling confident in this fight, but this is a redemption fight for Bonfim too. Like he feels like he needs to get back on track. And I think we're going to see a highly motivated Gabriel Bonfim on Saturday night. So I got him picking up the win. All right, Drew Dober versus Gene Sil- John Silva. John Silva. Uh, this is a fight where the odds makers, you can tell, they don't really know what to do with this because it's sitting at about even. And if you're looking at the fight on paper, it is kind of hard to tell. And Silva's most recent knockout over Jordan, the way he like framed and found that short upper, man, clean, clean. His ability to find angles and counter is uber impressive. He is extremely talented. He's great, like I said, at counterpunching, and he has power in his hands, right? And Jordan, we've seen Jordan get into some wars. Jordan is no joke. Charles Jordan is a legit opponent. But Drew Dober, I believe, is tied with Poirier for the most knockouts in lightweight history. And Drew Dober has been doing this for a while. Same kind of thing. We got this veteran in Drew Dober going up against a guy who's on like a 10 or 11 fight win streak and John Silva who's 27 years old. How old's Dober? Dober's a little bit older now, man. Uh, Dober's 35, right? So right in that like, just being honest and just looking at like historically, there's like that, you feel like he's got a two to three year window where he can stay like competitive depending on how things go, right? But anyway, uh, the odds makers don't seem to know what to do with this. And I view this in a lot of ways on a different level. And like I said, a different scale. We're stepping down in the rankings a little bit. And I understand that Silva is surging. I feel like the thing with Silva, though, is that we saw Jordan take him down a few times. And Dober's gone up against literally the best in the division in Islam Makachev. He's not incompetent on the ground. I can guarantee you that. He trains out of fucking elevation fight team with like Elliot Marshall. His jiu-jitsu is solid. It's just not on fucking Islam Makachev level. He can wrestle. And I feel like you can put Silva on the back foot 
And Dober is a guy, and I know Silva counters well, and that like maybe is the game that he plays. But Dober is a guy who's aggressive and goes first, and he does have a lot more experience. And I like him to win this fight. I feel like this is a the, the reason. I'm not saying Silva doesn't have a chance. Like I said, his fucking striking is super clean, and he could prove me wrong. But once again, it just comes down to turning this into a fight. And Dober's been in a lot of wars. He's fought the best that the UFC has to offer. And Silva's still trying to prove it. So that's just the, that's why I'm taking Dober. I feel like Dober is just going to be able to find a way, put Silva on the back foot. And Dober's not a guy that you want to be on the back foot against, right? It's like, it's the real question is what wins? Dober backing him up and going first or Silva's countering, right? And I think that there's potential for Dober to mix things up, go to the clinch a little bit, wear on some of that power. And like I said, make this a little bit more of a gritty fight. And then start letting the hands go a little bit more. I like Dober in this fight, man. Especially, too, just the home field advantage fighting in Denver. Everything is here for you, right? Where does John Silva train out of? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find his topology page here. Uh, Brazil. Where's he? Fighting nerds? What the fuck is that? Where's that? You guys ever heard of fighting nerds? I don't know. Where are they? I'm trying to find the location on here. Fighting. They're in Sao Paulo. If this is correct on Tapology, Fighting Nerds is the Jimmy's affiliated with in Sao Paulo. But you got to think, Dober's done his whole camp here. He's been here the entire time. And Silva's coming up from Brazil. It's an adjustment, right? So I, for those reasons and the odds being where they are, I really like putting money on Dober this weekend. Could be wrong, but the, just the way things trend, right? Uh, Oh, and I was going to say earlier before I got fucking sidetracked per usual. This fight reminds me a little bit of like Alaskarov versus Whitaker, where the odds makers didn't really know what to do with it because you're watching this guy and you're like, he could beat Whitaker. And then you get reminded like, oh yeah, fuck, there are levels. And he wasn't quite ready for this level jump. That's how I feel this fight's going to play out. Anyway, moving on to Santiago Ponznibio versus Muslim Salikov. Ponza Nibio has, he's obviously, he does a lot of the commentating, right? Like a lot of the Spanish commentary for the UFC. But uh, coming back again, fighting Muslim Salikov, he's actually three years younger than Salikov. Ponza Nibio's 37, Salikov's 40. And I think this is Ponza Nibio's fight to win. If he, if he can go out and just keep the volume on Salikov, Salikov is a good striker. He does have good wrestling, right? He has all those things, but... I just feel like Ponzinibbio is going to be a little bit busier on the feet. And he's a hard guy to deal with, man. Like, he's a good grappler. Very, I think he's a little bit more well-rounded. Like I said, just being three years younger even, I think is a big deal. Salikov coming. I, I believe his last fight was against Randy Brown, if I'm not mistaken. Let me look. Yeah, he lost to Randy Brown, right? First round knockout. It's like he's coming off a tough loss. Who'd Santiago fight last? I should know this, right? I should have this researched a little bit better, but it is what it is. Uh, Kevin Holland, he got knocked out in his most recent fight back in 2023. Uh, he's had a little bit more rest time than actually, yeah, than Salikov has. But either way, uh, I just feel like Ponzinibbio's style matches up well against Salikov. Salikov kind of throws these like he has these. He likes to spin a lot, right? And I feel like he looks for these moments, whereas Ponzinibbio is more willing to throw his hands and create those moments, right? Like I think in the striking department, just stylistically, Ponzinibbio is going to be able to put it on Salikov. And Salikov might be able to catch him with something. I mean, his striking is very legit, right? He's got that like uh, karate kind of style a little bit, but I like Ponzinibbio. All right, main event time. We got Rose Nama Yunez, who has moved up to flyweight, right? She's got a few fights here now, and she's going up against number 11 ranked Tracy Cortez. Cortez, like we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, is stepping in for Macy Barber. And this is a big leap up for Tracy Cortez. This is going to be the most skillful fighter she's ever fought. And uh, Cortez, if you watch her hands, very smooth boxing. Her hands are really fucking fast. And I feel like that if Rose just sits in the pocket and tries to have a boxing contest with Cortez, it could be a problem. Right? Like Cortez's hands are lightning fast and she, she's just like very, very gifted in the boxing department. I think she could give Rose a lot of problems in the pocket. But overall, I think Rose just moves so much better. I think she's got a little bit more in the toolbox. And Tracy Cortez is a pretty good wrestler, pretty good on the ground. But we've seen moments, right? Like in her fight against, I think, was it Judah Vicious? Sorry, guys, I'm mixing shit up. I should have all this pulled up for you. 
But I think it was her fight against Jasmine Judah Vicious. Da, da, da. Yeah. Or no, Melissa Gatto. I'm sorry. In her fight against Melissa Gatto, Gatto, you could see, like, Gatto took her back at times during that fight. And overall, Cortez was able to come up on top. But Rose has, like, elite level grappling in jiu-jitsu. Right? Like, we've seen it. But the question to me remains, is Rose, like, in terms of her frame, is she big enough to hang out here at Flyweight? Because having good jiu-jitsu is great, but if Cortez is able to dominate the wrestling exchanges and just end up on top and not let Rose submit her, just stay safe from that position, she might be okay. Because Cortez is probably more of a natural flyweight than Rose, but Rose, granted now, has had some time to put on some muscle and fill into this weight class a little bit more. So... I don't know. It's just going to be interesting to see how they look when they're in the cage together fighting, right? Like, I want to see how they look size-wise. And for Cortez, if she can just get the fight to the ground and maybe not give Rose those opportunities to let... But Rose is slick with it. Rose is slick with it. I would not want to risk that if I was Cortez. And again, I just feel like Rose is the one with more options. I feel like she's got better movement. I feel like she's going to be able to attack from different places. But... It could be that Cortez's hands and her power and her size and everything kind of freeze Rose up a little bit and don't allow some of those things to happen, similar to like the Manon fight a little bit, right? Or where Cortez realizes, I'm able to walk through your shots. I'm going to march forward and put it on you a little bit. That could happen too, right? There's a lot of unknowns in this one. I just feel like personally, Rose has more ways to get it done. I think she's, again, more skillful, not always the most important thing. Right, I feel like she's more skillful, and this is a big leap up in competition for Tracy Cortez going against a former world champion, even if it was a weight class below. So, and Rose has also rebounded with a big win over Amanda Heboss. But again, in that Heboss fight, I felt like Heboss was just so strong and was able to march through so many of the shots of Rose. And Heboss is striking; it's not clean like Cortez's. So if Cortez is able to sting Rose with some stuff, that can be discouraging. It can dissuade you. This is an interesting fight. Cortez's hands are really smooth. But I'm just saying, again, I'm leaning a lot towards veterans in this card, right? I feel like Rose has more experience. I feel like she's the better fighter in terms of if you just look at their talent and overall ability to combine everything together. I think it's Rose. But, man, Cortez's hands are something to worry about. So, fucking, we'll see. This is a good fight card. I'm excited. So, like I said, even though I can't really watch it live. And I can't, I'm not even going to it, which is a bummer because it's right down the road. But it is what it is. I'm trying to get back into archery and shoot more and get ready for hunting season and stuff. So anyway, guys, that's going to wrap this one up. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Much appreciated. Do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Thumbs up. All that good shit. I'll work on the, getting this stuff out to you more consistently. That way it's crazy, too, when I'm not recording. Cons it's like anything, right? Like when I don't go to jujitsu, if there are lapses in me going and – there have been lately because I've been shooting a lot more, right? But if there are lapses in me training, I notice it. And when I, I've been going a little bit more recently and you can kind of feel yourself kicking the rust off a little bit. And same thing with this. I haven't been talking into a microphone a lot and it fucking shows. I stutter. I get off track a lot. I don't keep my thoughts <laughs> nice and concise and consistent like I'd like to. So yeah, things to work on. But anyway, I'm done rambling, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the fights.